Okay, um, I think participants are still uh, joining the uh, jo joining this webinar, but uh, we will kick off. Uh, good morning from New York. Um, I am Richard Gowan, uh, Crisis Group's UN Director, and it's a real privilege to uh, be chairing this session with an all-star team of um, diplomatic heavyweights on the UN's 75th birthday. Uh, as we're speaking, um, leaders are giving short video messages to the UN General Assembly at an event to commemorate um, the 75th anniversary of the founding of the UN. Tomorrow, uh, the real business kicks off uh, with leaders giving their annual speeches to the UN. But this year, it's uh, a unique arrangement. Um, those speeches will all be by video because it's not possible for politicians and diplomats to meet in New York due to the coronavirus. Uh, the coronavirus has, as well as creating technical problems for the UN, I think raised some pretty fundamental questions about the functioning of the body and the quality of multilateral cooperation today, both in terms of response to the virus, but also the cooperation and, and tensions that it has created uh, in the Security Council and other UN forums. To discuss these issues and lots of other, other issues like the Iran snapback, uh, we're joined by Wendy Sherman, um, the former Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs um, at the State Department and a negotiator with long experience of dealing with the UN over issues such as Iran. Uh, Gerard Arrow, um, the former Ambassador of France to both the UN and the US, joins us from Paris. And Mark Malik Brown, uh, the former uh, Deputy Secretary General of the UN, is also with us. Mark is the chair of the Crisis Group Board of Trustees. Gerard and Wendy are also Crisis Group Trustees. And as I said at the, the outset, it's a real privilege to uh, be chairing this event with them. Um, what we're going to do is have uh, a couple of rounds of uh, uh, conversation uh, between me, um, Wendy, Gerard, and Mark. Uh, and then we will open the floor uh, to questions um, from all of you participating in this event. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, simply put it uh, in the Q&A box, um, not chat, uh, Q&A, and I will be selecting and reading questions to the panelists as they come in. Uh, we've also received a number of questions in advance, um, which I have uh, on file ready to go. So, the UN is 75. Um, Mark, let's start with you. Is this a happy 75th birthday for the organization? Uh, or should we be worried about um, uh, its fourth quarter century coming up? Well, the great glory about the UN is it's always there. And however old I get, the UN is always 10 years older than me, which has been a, a, a source of uh, uh, making me feel permanently young, I suppose. Um, but, you know, I think perhaps more than for a very long time, while perhaps its existence is not questioned, it's kind of like a comfortable piece of furniture we've all gotten used to having around. You know, I think there are desperately serious questions about its relevance. Uh, and, you know, when you look across the different fronts of its activities, understandably so. Uh, I mean, the, this era of highly bilateralized global foreign policy has led the UN to be very marginalized in the political and security spheres. Uh, it's to some extent compensated for that, as it did during the Cold War years, uh, by focusing on a set of social, environmental and economic issues where it's kind of allowed more space. So on the SDGs and, and, and climate change, I think it's a really important convening force. And it's also kept human rights alive at a time that, you know, in a lot of the world, that door has been slammed shut. So I think what we're in some ways seeing is a repeat of a rather sort of tenuous hold on the world by the UN of the kind we saw during the Cold War. Cold War, political gridlock, the Security Council, utterly dysfunctional, uh, but 
around the issues of decolonization and the technical assistance to get new states on their feet and around the humanitarian support to the mass migrations and movements of people in the aftermath of that again a very active un so i fear and i you know i'm i'm the development one amongst the three of us but from my perspective you know it seems that it's on the development and humanitarian side that the un you know, next decade or so may lie. And I say it with great regret because I'd love to see a more politically forceful UN as well. Thank you, Mark. Um, Wendy, Mark, Mark politely didn't mention uh, <laughs> the US in his remarks, but I think uh, it's fairly obvious that um, this US administration has had a fairly turbulent relationship with the United Nations. I mean, how, how would you assess uh, US-UN ties um, the day before Trump gives his uh, fourth speech to the General Assembly? Well, first of all, thank you, Richard, and thanks for having me here with the crisis group, which is just doing extraordinary work around the world. And um, to the listeners, we really all should be listening to Richard Gowan, who is the deep UN expert here. But I appreciate Mark's opening remarks, because I think they set a really good context for this discussion. This is all very personal for me, and if I just may take a moment, my parents were at the founding of the UN 75 years ago. Uh, my father was a Marine. He had uh, fought in the canal, had been injured, and he was recovering uh, in San Francisco on the west coast of the United States. And while he was still an enlisted man in uniform, he was very concerned, as was my mother, that there not be war again. And so they both got very active in the founding of the UN, and uh, they were very active in creating what became the American Veterans Committee for there to be veterans who worked for a UN. And it's also personal because when I was the Under Secretary for Political Affairs, my first week was at the UN high level meetings, and my last week, five uh, ungas later was at the UN high level week. So the UN has been very pivotal to my life and to the choices I've made in my life. Uh, but I quite agree with Mark, we are at a tough place and often it has been the United States which has helped to lead the United Nations, pushed the agendas of the United Nations. And as I think everyone knows who is listening, President Trump is very much the bilateralist that Mark spoke of, very much the anti-multilateralist. Uh, the US uh, under his administration has left the WHO, has left the Human Rights Council, has left UNESCO, uh, the development agencies that are quite critical to solving the issues of pandemics, of climate, um, and, and of other uh, matters of great concern. Um, this is an administration which has not only in terms of world multilateral organizations, but even institutions in the United States uh, try to deinstitutionalize policy and make it quite personal. Uh, most of the decisions made in this country are not about the structures and the checks and balances we have within our own constitution, but about presidential political power and how to amass the ability to not only have an America first agenda, but to really have a president first agenda. So I think uh, tomorrow, uh, when the president speaks at the UN, uh, we will hear, and I know Gerard will speak to this, uh, the assertion by the administration that the multilateral sanctions against Iran have been re constituted and snapped back, which of course is not the case. I think we will hear uh, from the president about the coronavirus and how uh, he is going to take care of the US, what great progress the US has made and how terrible it was that China didn't stop the virus. I think uh, he will challenge uh, the UN as a multilateral institution in the way he's challenged NATO uh, to pay its bills better and not to rely on the United States. He has rejected globalism. He may indeed take on uh, US contributions uh, to the United Nations. Um, so I think we will hear the echo 
of the first speech he made at the UN, which was a great challenge to the institution, but also an assertion that the US would do whatever the US needed to do to take care of its interests, uh, and that the US did not share, in his view, uh, the globalist approach that the United Nations seeks to take. Uh, the last point I'll make, and then I'll stop at this point, is that the US is completely consumed uh, with its election, which comes up November 3rd. Uh, and whatever the president says tomorrow, in terms of our politics, will probably have very little effect. Uh, America is not paying attention, painfully, to what's going on in the world or at the UN, except how it immediately affects us in terms of the coronavirus, um, the painful, painful death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, a justice in the Supreme Court, which has, at least for this week, refocused attention on filling the Supreme Court vacancy. The president's announced that he will say who his choice is Friday or Saturday, allowing the funeral arrangements for the justice to go forward first. Uh, but uh, we will be consumed then with the upcoming presidential debate on September 29th. So my point here is no matter what the president says tomorrow, the focus for the American public is not at the United Nations. Thank you, Wendy. I mean, I would also add to that that a lot of diplomats at the UN and certainly UN officials um, are probably more focused on the US elections too, um, uh, even in this General Assembly week, because there is a real sense that uh, what happens in November uh, will be a fork in the road. And uh, the US voters' choice of a president will very much affect um, not only the future of the US, but also the future of the UN, um, because of some without of Without a doubt, without yeah. a doubt. Um, Gerard, Wendy touched on it, but clearly uh, one topic for President Trump tomorrow will be Iran. Uh, the US in August uh, announced that it would trigger the reimposition of sanctions uh, on Iran suspended uh, under the, well, terminated under the 2015 uh, nuclear deal, despite the fact that the US left um, the nuclear deal in 2018. Uh, the vast majority of council members, including the European council members, have rejected uh, the US claim to reimpose sanctions. Uh, how serious do you think this rift is for the future of um, uh, the Security Council, but also transatlantic ties? Thank you. First, thank you to, to have invited me. It's great to be with you today. Um, first, I think what is important to, to remember is that the great powers have never accepted that the United Nations would interfere with the major conflict where they had, or they considered they had, uh, vital interest. Uh, of course, look with Russia, with Syria and Ukraine, but also the United States uh, with the Israeli-Arab conflict or with Iraq. So in a lot of geopolitical conflicts, Actually, the role of the United Nations has always been, in a sense, limited. Uh, and Iran is a very good example, because basically the negotiations was out of the United Nations and conducted by the free Europeans and the United States, uh, Russia and China. And we went to the UN Security Council, in a sense, to have a stamp of legitimacy. So what is at stake today with this snapback story, for me is more dramatic than substantial. You know, the Iran, uh, the Iran crisis, uh, in a sense, has never been solved or handled in the United Nations, and it won't be in the future handled in the United Nations. I go back to what Mark has said in the beginning. Uh, in geopolitical terms, the role of the UN Security Council has been generally quite limited by the Cold War first, and after that, by the fact that the great powers basically told the UN Security Council uh, not to uh, interfere with, the, with a lot of issues. Uh, but in geopolitical terms, I want to emphasize one continent where the UN had a major role, which is Africa. In Africa, millions of human beings, you know, were dying, 
in the total indifference of the, the international community and the UN Security Council has been active. It could be, have been more or less effective, but it was, it was active. And I think in the future, it should remain uh, it should remain active because usually in, in Africa, let's be frank, major powers don't consider that their vital interests are at stake. But going back to Iran, again, it's a lot, it's melodrama, but I'm not sure that it will have major consequences on the UN Security Council. As for the, the transatlantic relationship, to be frank, uh, the Iran uh, uh, dispute is only a, a small part of a bigger, uh, a bigger landscape, uh, which could become, if uh, Donald Trump is reelected, which could, could become quite significant uh, in terms of, I don't know, confrontation, but at least dis disagreement uh, between both sides of the Atlantic. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Um, I mean, given the, the limits on the UN that we describe, um, Mark, it is clearly very difficult for the current Secretary General, um, Antonio Guterres, to solve um, or even have leverage over a lot of today's major political disputes. Uh, by contrast, uh, I think most of us watching the UN feel that Guterres has had a good crisis when it comes to COVID-19. He's been uh, very thoughtful and far-sighted in talking about the economic uh, impact of the disease and the social impact of the disease. Uh, what do you feel um, the role of the Secretary General is um, these days? I mean, especially having worked with Kofi Annan, who would be in most people's top two uh, SGs, I would say. Oh, Mark, you're on mute. Ah, there we are. Sorry, the host had muted me. I don't know what I've done to uh, <laughs> uh, deserve such such sanction. Um, look, I, I, I think I think the Secretary General has had a good crisis. I agree with that, but I think it was contained in the subordinate phrase in your sentence, though, which was amongst those who follow him or follow the <laughs> UN, because I, the bad news is nobody's noticed he's had a good crisis outside the circle of us UN watchers. And this is really something strange happening because, uh, you know, Antonio Guterres is one, was one of the most qualified individuals to step into this job. He has an, one of the best communications teams that any Secretary General has had. And yet, actually, I really don't think his voice is resonating in any sort of significant global way. I think he's gone through a journey. I think he began by believing that even accepting Gerard's point about the big conflicts really coming to the UN, that he could sort of lead a mediation of the second tier conflicts. So a lot of his early tenure was spent in Libya, uh, Somalia, even Syria, trying to, even Cyprus, trying to find a uh, resolution to these conflicts. And then I think recognized what we've all touched on, this emergence of the UN as more of a sort of uh, platform and a mobilizer around the environmental and social agenda. And so he's put his foot there. And probably the most significant image of his secretary generalship was standing in his suit with his trouser legs wound up on the cover of Time or Newsweek magazine, uh, talking about the rising, uh, rising waters as a result of climate change. So I think he knows where he's got to sort of put his rhetoric and his, 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 his emphasis, uh, which is on those issues. And therefore COVID tragedy that it is would seem to be the perfect issue because it's you know about now both a public health reinforcement, but about an economic recovery because it's the poorest countries and the poorest people in those countries who are disproportionately at risk, not so much from the public health impact necessarily, but from the subsequent economic impact. And, you know, and, and yet he's not really cutting through. And this is partly, I think, the history that on these issues, it's more the World Bank and the IMF, which really, you know, wield the big checkbook. Uh, and 
typically are turned to at times of economic reconstruction. But I think it is more broadly that he's standing astride such a fragmented world that even on these relatively non-controversial issues, you know, people are listening to others. They're not listening to him. So, I mean, one final piece of advice, you've all said it, you know, I expect nobody uh, will keep have their fingers crossed as much as Antonio Guterres on election night. Uh, his fate's going to be decided along with that of Joe Biden and Donald Trump by who wins. Uh, that, that said, I, I would note that um, uh, I think one of one of the successes of Guterres' um, tenure has been that he has built a working relationship with President Trump. And although President Trump has not always been a friend to the UN, um, Guterres has actually built some sort of uh, channel of communication with the White House, which we were not certain would be the case in 2017. But I, I think you're absolutely right. Well, look, Richard, I shouldn't jump in again but, and abuse your, your hospitality, but I would just say that, I mean, you know, as a veteran of oil for food and dealing with Washington in those days, I am full of admiration for the way that the Secretary General has managed the relationship with Washington. But I'm also aware of the huge cost he and the organization have paid. They have basically had to self-censor themselves for the last four years. And that's therefore at huge cost to their standing and purpose uh, in the rest of the world. Um, well, actually, p pivoting off that and, and turning to Wendy, um, uh, how do you feel a, the next U.S. administration uh, could rebuild relations if it was so minded to do so um, after this, yeah, uh, incredibly tough period? So I, I quite agree with what Mark said, and that's why I was nodding my head vigorously. I, I think that Gutierrez did establish a relationship, but at an enormous cost of his own voice and of the, a voice for the world. Uh, and, you know, I think he felt because of the finances of the UN, he had no choice. And because of the US power, even under this administration, he had no choice, but it did come at a huge cost. I, you know, I, I'm not here speaking as a surrogate for the Biden administration, but if you think about um, Vice President Biden's history, uh, the people who surround him, uh, these are folks who understand that the first um, objective of uh, a presidency would be to get the coronavirus under control in our country, because it's quite out of control, uh, to really put a pandemic plan in place, to invest in our economy, our supply chains, infrastructure, um, to make sure that people feel that our economy can open again in a safe way, our power comes from our economic strength, our military strength, and our political strength, which is basically the values of democracy. All of those have been challenged over the last four years in pretty profound ways. And so I think a Biden administration is going to have to reinvest in that. But the vice president has also said that it will be really critical to reestablish our alliances uh, and our relationships around the world. Uh, as Gerard mentioned, uh, the transatlantic relationship is utterly uh, broken. I was gonna say in chaos, but it's not even that good. It's just broken. Uh, and that um, he would uh, reinvest in those relationships. Uh, really understanding we're in a multipolar world. There's no question about that. Uh, the world is not where it was when Donald Trump became president, we do have the rise of more autocrats around the world because in a time of great uncertainty and rapid technological and social change, uh, people uh, are quite uncertain and autocrats often say, we'll bring you certainty and security. You just have to give up all your civil and human rights to get it uh, for some time. Uh, and the last point I'll make, which we haven't talked about here yet, but must, is that there will be a great competition continuing between the United States and China. Uh, and that will have a profound impact on where multilateral institutions go. Uh, China, as you've written about, Richard, um, really has not moved forward 
to take a leadership role in the United Nations, um, but it is trying to wield its economic power. When the United States left the WHO, China came forward with a major contribution to the WHO. I don't think China is ready to step up to the kind of leadership the US has provided in the past in a multilateral world, but it will be interested to see uh, how things move forward. And I would expect a Biden administration to provide some of the leadership that is necessary in multilateral institutions. Again, appreciating that we have to get our country back together again and rebuild the institutions inside our country to be even able to conduct uh, diplomacy because as most of you know, 60% of the senior foreign service in the State Department is gone. Uh, and so there's a lot of institution rebuilding that has to happen here to be able to conduct effective diplomacy. Thank you, Wendy. Actually, uh, one of the first uh, questions that has come in over the Q&A is precisely about the question of how uh, the panelists see China's uh, role at the UN, which has evolved hugely in the last few years. Um, Gerard, I would, would ask you also to, to reflect on how you think China will reshape the UN system, but also perhaps to touch on Europe's role, because uh, it often seems to fall to European countries to uh, attempt to prop up the multilateral system in periods of crisis. Uh, President Macron has been, uh, I think, pretty central to multilateral discussions of the response to COVID-19. So how do you see Europe's role um, evolving in the UN, but also how do you see China weighing in? So I think we have to be uh, realistic. Um, the whole power politics are not going to vanish. Whoever is elected in, in Washington, D.C., uh, the new American president will not suddenly, uh, you know, really consider that the U.N. may interfere with uh, U.S. foreign policy. And uh, the same thing, of course, in China and Russia and, and elsewhere. So I suspect that in the coming years, uh, power politics will be there and the United Nations will be a sort of marginalized uh, in this uh, fight between carnivores. Where, where, so we have to try to define what could be the use of, of the United Nations in the coming decades. And I think Mark has touched on that. Humanitarian affairs, you know, more than 60 or 70 millions of refugees, which is by far the largest number since 1945. Uh, as I have said, you have these endless conflicts in Africa, which are not on the front page of the newspapers, but where thousands, dozens of thousands of people are killed. You know, South Sudan, for, for instance, you know, nobody cares about South Sudan or Republic Centrafricaine. And here, the UN may have, you know, the, te you know, the technique uh, and also the, comp you know, the competence and the, the prestige to, to, to act. But you have also other issues that we, are, we have started to touch upon. Uh, because on one side, uh, you have, as I've said, power politics between uh, different countries. But also these countries have things or concerns in common. And maybe that the UN should try, in a sense, to shift to its attention to these new issues. You know, the world is entering into a new technological transition. So artificial intelligence, the ethics of artificial intelligence, where can we have a definition of the ethics of artificial intelligence, but in the UN? Cyber war, you know, why shouldn't have really a treaty on the law of war, of cyber, of cyber war, but also the governance of the cyberspace? Uh, and a lot of other issues that, of course, we could handle with other international organizations like the World Bank. You know, when we are talking about cryptocurrencies, about finance, uh, money laundering, you have a lot, a lot of issues in the smaller and smaller world. Because the, the paradox that we are facing is on one side, you have power politics in a way we had it in 1914, but also the world is much smaller. So in a sense, we are also constrained to some form of solidarity. And this solidarity actually should be managed in a sort of forward-looking way by, uh, by the UN. And to go back to your question, since I'm supposed to pretend to answer to your question, uh, I think 
uh, I would want uh, Europe to be a bit more carnivore, uh, to not to be not to be swallowed by other monsters. But also, of course, they have uh, their own uh, their own ideas, their own commitment to multilateralism. But last point, I don't see the Europe moving forward without the United States. You know, really, we have common values. We have a common civilization, even if we have, of course, differences. And so that's the reason also why, for the Europeans, uh, the result of the election on November the 3rd will be critical. Thank you, Gerard. I'm actually going to uh, put one other quest question to you as we move into the, the Q&A session. And just a reminder to all participants, um, if you want to ask a question, uh, type it in the Q&A box and I will pass it on. Um, but already we've had six or seven people actually uh, asking through the Q&A, uh, isn't the answer to this unfortunate state of affairs in New York Security Council reform? And uh, shouldn't we try to uh, alter the composition of the Security Council or uh, change the rules around the veto? to make the Security Council more efficient. Um, Gerard, you sat in the Security Council <laughs> for three or four years. Um, you did years. actually, five, five years, years, five years. Um, and you also sponsored uh, some interesting efforts actually to reform the use of the veto uh, about six or seven years ago. Um, is Security Council reform the answer? Well, actually the first, uh, the Security Council uh, should be reformed. Uh, because it's, you know, we should have on the Security Council countries like India or Japan or an African country or a South American country, you know, it would make sense. And that's the reason why actually France and, uh, and UK especially, uh, we are in favor of the reform of the Security Council. The problem is uh, what I called general selfishness. You know, Italy is in favor of really enlarging the Security Council, but not to Germany. Uh, China is in favor of enlarging the Security Council, but not to Japan and not to India. Brazil is in favor, Mexico is in favor, but not to Brazil. So there is a general uh, neutralization of all the countries, uh, which fr really frankly uh, makes reform of the Security Council uh, for the moment impossible. So the, the French having a lot of imagination, we at some moment we found that instead of creating new permanent members, which I called first class passengers, we could, we could have longer terms for some countries, what I would call business class member, membership. Uh, but to be frank, it went, uh, it went to nowhere. So unfortunately, uh, and really unfortunately for a lot of different reasons, France has a inter vested interest into enlarging Security Council. For the moment, I don't see how we could, we could move forward uh, as I have said, everybody is in favor of the principle, but against its neighbor. Thank you. And I think it's, it's worth saying as well that in the last few years, certainly in my experience, um, Chinese diplomats in New York have become more and more frank about their rejection of any reform that favors Japan, uh, which is a, a huge obstacle to, to any sort of change. Um, Mark, I, I'm going to pick up a, another question we've received, uh, which is about the Human Rights Council. Um, the questioner points out that uh, there have been discussions of Sri Lanka's uh, human rights records in Geneva, but Sri Lanka has largely ignored um, most of these discussions. Uh, you were working with Kofi Annan uh, when he promoted the creation of the Human Rights Council in 2005. Um, you mentioned that the Human Rights elements of the UN are under strain. Uh, what future do you see for them in uh, a tough geopolitical environment? Well, it is an interesting footnote on that time because I was also sort of his, his if you like, engineer who wrote the reform plan for him very much to his uh, Kofi Annan's direction. But, you know, our idea was to promote both human rights and uh, the sort of whole economic and social to a sort of parallelism with 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 the um, uh, with with the Security Council and also to bring in a peace building commission. So it was an attempt at a quite ambitious 
institutional reform, but we were always very wary about the human rights piece for it because we worried that we would end up putting old wine in a new bottle. Um, and that, you know, far from removing the sort of culture wars that had destroyed the Human Rights Council Commission before, that we just give them a new playing field and a new lease of life. And to be honest, I think largely, sadly, that is what has happened. Um, but, you know, I've always felt that the UN has both a great strength and a great weakness in the human rights field. Its strength is that it's in intergovernmental and its weakness is that it's intergovernmental, <laughs> which constrains its ability to really kind of, you know, put governments often in the dock. And when it does, it's always, there's a political rather than a rights-based reason that they've ended up there or too often there is at least. And so I look at the human rights mechanisms of the UN as, in a sense, having to sort of float in an ecosystem of their own, along with civil society and all those non-governmental human rights groups, the Amnesty Internationals, Human Rights Watch, you name it. And, you know, when that bit of the system is healthy, then it kind of lifts up with it uh, the UN's mechanism, but when it's not, and that UN mechanism is entirely dependent on the political authority of New York, it's always in trouble. And I think now, to be honest, there's a bigger, there's also a new meta trend coming in. When you look at the rise of China, the rebalancing of the UN, the rebalancing of the world, the rebalancing of issues towards these sort of climate change, social issues we've discussed, you're seeing, frankly, I'm sorry to say, it's tragic to say it, but a move away from individual human rights, political and civil, particularly towards a more collective vision of social and environmental rights. And I think, you know, we're seeing the UN move in that direction. And I really count on civil society to stop them doing it, because I think the political and civil work around individual rights is so important. Uh, Wendy, a, a question for you that is partially related. Um, one of the one of the participants flags the fact that the, the U.S. continues to be outside the International Criminal Court, um, and recently it has announced sanctions against the ICC prosecutor um, because uh, of the court's uh, investigation, um, the action I think U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Uh, do you feel that foreseeable we could imagine the U.S. taking international justice more seriously again? Um, and how could that be engineered? Because this, I think, is a, you know, this is another part of the architecture which feels very fragile today. Yes, um, I think international justice and justice in general is in a fractured place. Justice is certainly fractured inside the United States and around the world and in many countries uh, to build off of what Mark said about individual and human rights. Um, you know, the United States has always had an internal debate, as most countries do, between sovereignty and multilateralism, whether in fact sovereignty is all things. Uh, Gerard understands this and Mark certainly as a UK citizen about the forming of the European Union versus the Brexit which Europe is undergoing. This is a fundamental tension that I think exists in all of our countries. And because the United States has often been the go-to military force for democracy, it complicates decisions made about international bodies opining uh, on these issues. That said, I think that a Biden administration certainly would want to reinvest in international justice in a way that's appropriate to the ongoing debate regarding sovereignty. Uh, and I think it's quite important. And I think that uh, one of the places where the UN can be a critical voice is around individual and human rights, about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the importance of that, because we see in individual countries those rights both moving forward and being challenged in new and very profound ways. So 
this is a really important place. And I'm just going to use this moment to also address another issue of both rights and leadership. Uh, and note for all the listeners that of the 52 first speakers at the United Nations, beginning tomorrow, heads of state, the first 52 are all men. And one of the things that we had seen a, a rising movement around was women leaders. And I have some graduate students who are doing some research on whether women leaders were really better leaders in the time of coronavirus in terms of keeping their country safe. I think it's probably a lot more about attributes than gender, but that said, gender has been an issue and I don't want that issue as we move forward uh, to be undermined uh, in the world. It's quite critical that we continue a, a world that represents the diversity of all that we are and it pains me that the first 52 speakers tomorrow are all men. Did I leave you speechless, Richard? You're on mute. <laughs> Richard's on mute. Yeah. Never muting. Okay, I was no, I, I, I was, I was left speechless because, especially, <laughs> um, uh, you know, especially in a year when the UN is is celebrating its work on uh, women, peace, and security, and uh, looking back to the Beijing conference, uh, it, it is truly amazing that the first 52 speakers of the General Assembly are all men. So um, I was speechless, but the power of that lack of speech was was undermined by the fact I was also on mute. Um, <laughs> Mark, uh, a couple of questions have come in that I think will probably bring back some bad memory for you um, because uh, participants are asking um, about money and uh, whether uh, do you think that the UN will face major funding challenges in the context of a COVID recession? Mm. Um, and would there be ways, uh, someone asks perhaps through some sort of international tax, to get more reliable revenue streams for the UN? Uh, which would mean that aid agencies and indeed the Secretary General had to spend less time worrying about budgets and more on delivery. Well, look, I think first, uh, undoubtedly, Richard, the UN will face a funding crunch and, you know, even more seriously, so will the countries it seeks to help because, you know, while there has been a prioritization of humanitarian funding this year to try and deal with the sort of frontline COVID emergency, you know, the longer term development spend trend is horrible uh, with as donor countries GDP shrink they're cutting budgets to, to, to match that. There's huge investments in new areas like vaccine development, for example, and other issues which are just going to squeeze the frontline funding, whether it's through the UN or through NGOs or other sources to uh, you know, public health, education, all the sort of basic frontline services that make the lives of the world's poor uh, bearable. Um, and so it's going to be really challenging. Now, is, is there a way through this? I mean, obviously, an international tax would be the way. The environment for that was much better a decade or so ago, and France was a real innovator, as Gerard would know better than me, in terms of an airline tax, which is the idea of President Chirac, which we were all incredibly excited about when it began. But trying to build any kind of international support for that has proved deeply elusive and you know I, I think like with so much for the UN you know ultimately it's got to get to the issue of demonstrating its basic effectiveness around the things that matter most to people in the world and then securing the funding for it and I very much doubt the Secretary General or his lieutenants are going to get a break and get a tax. I fear this is always going to be about keeping the UN relevant and securing the funding around that. What I think will change is less a tax, but I think the one area where the will change is an awful lot more non-government money coming into the UN, whether it is through corporations, foundations, etc. You just can just see the face of, of, of UN finances changing in that way. States are stepping back, 
others are filling at least some of the vacuum. Thank you, Mark. And that, that final point, I think, also answers a question from another participant about the relationship between business and, and the UN. Um, Gerard, I'd, I'd like to turn to you and come back to geopolitics and specifically one crisis that you worked on a great deal when you were in New York, uh, which is the Syrian war. Um, the Syrian war, uh, in addition to being an appalling tragedy, has also, I think, I think done immense damage to the credibility of the Security Council over nearly a decade. Uh, one participant asks, what role is there for the UN now in, in Syria? First, I, I think it's, uh, I want to, to rebound on what Mark said and what you re were referring also, uh, the relationship between, uh, with the business community. I want to emphasize that a lot of the issues that we are facing now are not handled only by states. We had, you know, France had the experience of the COP2021 about, uh, about environment and fighting climate change. And obviously, it was not a top-down approach with the states deciding. We had to mobilize the business community, the NGOs, but also the territories, the cities. And I think a lot of issues that we are going to face will need this new approach. And I think the UN can be, you know, really the point where all these forces, uh, progressive forces can, can meet. And in Syria, let's be frank, you know, really in a sense, Assad has won. Uh, and uh, now the question is, of course, and that's a political question, is what the UN should do. Uh, should the UN contribute to rebuilding the country uh, and uh, considering that it's, it will be a way also of, also of consolidating Assad? And uh, that's, that's, a political, uh, that's a political judgment. And, uh, and as you know, it's not the UN which is going to take the decision. The decision will be taken by the member states and especially by the countries like the US, like France, like the UK. You know, really, do we accept the defeat uh, of, uh, of the forces who try to, uh, to topple down Assad? Uh, can we get something from Assad in exchange of the financial uh, support? You know, really, uh, because it's not only a question of vindic vindicativeness on our side. It's also the fact that you have dozens of thousands of Syrians who have disappeared. Uh, when we know they have been killed, tortured. There are a lot of people who are in the jails. And also the fact that when the Assad forces are recovering, a part of their territory, they start by killing, by expelling, or, or uh, you know, or by imprisoning uh, the opponents. So, should we have a debate, uh, you know, a dialogue with some conditions about rebuilding Syria? I think it would be an unavoidable uh, uh, process, you know, really. And again, the Secretary General of the UN could be uh, could be the channel. But let's let's be. I think realistic, uh, Hafez al -Assad, Hafez, Bashar al Assad has never, has never shown any availability, any opening uh, to uh, uh, really a sort of a peaceful outcome. He has always tried to eradicate, and eradicate in its physical meaning of the word, the word to eradicate, eradicate the opposition, which makes, of course, difficult for us. Uh, to contribute to the rebuilding of Syria. Thank you, Gerard. Um, Wendy, another question uh, concerning the Middle East, um, but this time uh, shifting to uh, Israel. And you know, obviously, uh, Israel is often at the center of many contentious debates in the UN. Uh, one participant asks, uh, do you think that the, the progress that the Trump administration has made in terms of normalization of relations between Israel and Bahrain and UAE, uh, will that gradual process of Israel reconciling with its neighbors um, affect uh, discussions of Israel and Palestine at the UN? And I guess especially the two-state solution, which has been such a focus at the UN for so many years. Very complicated question. I think that everyone should welcome 
the fact that the UAE and Bahrain have said that they want to create a more normal relationship with Israel. Uh, we all want anything that moves us toward peace and security. And having a less contentious neighborhood is good. Uh, I suspect there will be other countries that will join them. What those agreements mean, however, is not yet clear. Will it be that airplanes can fly between countries over Saudi airspace? Or will it mean their embassies? Or will it mean something deeper? And I don't think we know the answer to those questions yet. And they all may be variable. We also don't know whether, in fact, this will in any way help the Palestinian cause. Um, it is indeed true that the UAE made a condition of their normalization, and I use that term quite broadly uh, because I'm not sure exactly what its meaning will be in each of these instances, um, that Israel not move ahead with annexation. And that is a good thing, and that is good for the Palestinians because moving forward with annexation would have truly been a death knell for a two-state process. However, we've heard from the uh, Israeli prime minister, uh, more in private than in public, that uh, this is a pause, not a fait accompli, that annexation will not happen. And that is of great concern. And that is, I believe, the prime minister managing his own internal politics and his own personal politics around the indictment uh, against him. Um, I feel terribly for the Palestinians because uh, they must feel that attention has been removed from them and focused more on Iran and creating a fence uh, around the neighborhood uh, to push Iran out of the neighborhood. I don't think Iran will leave the neighborhood. I don't think this is the way alone to solve this problem of Iran's malign behavior in the region. I think that Israel has reason to uh, be concerned about the United Nations because it has been a very contentious place for Israel uh, and a very concerning place for Israel. Um, so that the UAE, Bahrain, and other countries may in fact normalize the relations, may change, may well change the dynamics at the UN in a positive way for Israel, which would be a good thing. But we have not solved Middle East peace through this process. We have not solved the concerns about Iran through this process. And we certainly have not helped create a two-state solution so that the Palestinians have a place they can call a state and home, and Israel can live in peace and security as a Jewish state. So a, quite a long way to go here. Thank you. Um, we're coming towards the end of our hour, and um, I'm afraid that we're not going to be able to cover all the interesting questions we've, we've received, and apologies to those that we omit. Um, but I'd, I'd like to uh, I'd like to end perhaps on a on a note that will make us feel a little more positive. <laughs> um, uh, Robert Cooper, I, I think, um, uh, you know, a very well known former UK and European official, has a question, um, and it is for each of you. Uh, what would you say in this seventy fifth anniversary year is the best thing the UN has ever done? But also, what would you like to see change, um, you know, within the realms of the possible uh, at the UN, uh, most urgently? Uh, Mark, I'll start with you. Well, I'm, I'm going to at least stay consistent and say the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. And why? Because it, the UN used its convening power to do something much bigger <clears throat> than itself, to coalesce the whole of government's own spe domestic spending priority around the world, most notably China, uh, but all over the world, as well as the aid debate and priorities and the, the whole debate about debt relief, girded everybody into alignment, and not least the UN and the World Bank, which were normally at war with each other. You know, everybody suddenly was talking the same language, marching in the same direction. And in a generation, we have done dramatic things together to reduce poverty and it's now sadly been set back some by the by covid but great achievement the un able to use its convening power rather than its direct operational capacity to do something very big indeed and what would you most like to see change 
<laughs> what would I most like to see change that damn Security Council uh, reform <laughs> and made uh, relevant, although I completely share uh, Gerard's and well, and Wendy's both their descriptions and how difficult that is. Gerard, um, uh, Gerard is, is on mute, so I will turn to Wendy first while he's unmuted. Uh, best thing about the UN thing that you would most like to see change? Uh, I would reinforce what Mark has said about the efforts around the MDGs and the SDGs and the United States public for the most part doesn't know what either one is. Uh, but uh, everywhere I traveled in the world, everyone else did. And they saw them as quite critical as creating reform within their own countries and using those goals as a way to try to make both internal and regional and then world progress for people in their day-to-day -day lives to really reduce poverty and create a better life. I'd, I'd also add one other thing. Multilateralism sometimes works. Uh, the Iran nuclear deal, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, even after the United States, the most powerful country yet in the world, left the deal under Donald Trump, it hung together because it was a multilateral agreement uh, voted by the UN Security Council 15 to nothing, uh, supported by the UN General Assembly. It's now hanging by a very slender thread after a lot of actions on many people's parts and countries' parts. But nonetheless, sometimes multilateralism creates a backdrop that allows something to be durable and sustainable for longer than one can imagine. And what I would like to see changed, two things. One, yes, I agree there needs to be reform to the institution, very serious reform. and it is difficult and perhaps right now impossible. And the other is to um, really uh, footstamp something Gerard said, which is that it should be because of particularly the technological challenges we have ahead around AI, cyber, space, um, quantum physics, be a place where NGOs, business, governments, regional organizations, can all talk with each other and create the norms that we will need for the future. They are critical and they must be mighty. Thank you. Gerard. Well, actually, uh, Wendy has just stolen my final line. You know, oh. really. <laughs> so so I, I concur totally with, with Wendy. We have to invent, in a sense, a new transatlantic, a new agenda, a new UN agenda, you know, for the coming decades. And, uh, and Wendy has given, you know, the main elements of this, uh, this new agenda. Uh, before leaving, I want simply also to pay, and I think everybody will agree with me, to pay an homage to the thousands of experts, young, uh, young uh, women and young men and soldiers uh, who are doing an incredible job on the ground. You know, really people don't know it but in places which are very, very difficult, like in, like in Africa. Every time like, when I went there with the UN Security Council, I was really moved by what these people were doing in a daily basis. They were living in the most uncomfortable way, and they were doing a lot, you know, bringing to the population, you know, relief and, and protection. You can always uh, really joke about the United Nations, about bureaucracy, about the UN, uh, keeping uh, uh, peacekeeping operations, and I I'm very good at doing it myself, as people who know me, uh, uh, you know, are, are know. Uh, but uh, really, frankly, I've seen also people, really people being 25 years old and spending two years, you know, really sleeping on the ground and, and doing their best to help. And that's something that we couldn't, we shouldn't uh, uh, really forget. Thank you, Gerard. I think that's the the best note to end on. And I would say also that uh, my colleagues at Crisis Group, um, those who do not, like me, simply sit in Brooklyn, but those who are out in the field in um, Africa and the Middle East, uh, work very closely with our colleagues at, at the UN. And while we are sometimes critical of the UN's positions, um, we constantly admire the dedication of its people. Um, and actually, I think it would be 
only suitable for me to, because you mentioned experts, to, to end this conversation by talking about one expert who can't be with us, but who was doing some great work for Crisis Group on China and the UN. And that is Michael Kovrig, who Absolutely. unfortunately, while doing that work, uh, was arbitrarily detained for political reasons in China. Um, the last thing he wrote for us back in 2018 before he was detained was a very, very interesting study of China and peacekeeping. And so mm -hmm. if we can wish for anything on the 75th anniversary, it's that Michael uh, should be freed and be returned to us to continue that work, because I think he was a great believer in that, um, uh, that line of investigation. Um, Gerard, Wendy, Mark, uh, one of the commentators um, uh, said specifically to thank you for your extremely honest um, interventions here today. I think that was a very blunt, um, a very accurate summary of uh, the state of the UN at 75. Uh, another commentator asked me to compliment you all on your libraries, uh, <laughs> which uh, are indeed very impressive. So um, thank you very much indeed. I hope that you now have some time to take down a good book and um, lose yourself in that. But thank you for a great conversation. And um, we look forward to continuing this, these debates. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.